talk about exploring the secret lives of animals. Please welcome our four panelists to the stage. Shane Ger Garrow, Jacinta Beener, Mimi Kessler, Tom Peshak. Way to go, man. See? Yeah. Secret lives. <laughs> it's an enticing line, isn't it? The secret animals are going about their I can, days. I could talk ways. about it for a few days. <laughs> Come on. Are you serious? Oh, I'd kick his ass out. Imagined. Communicating in distinct dialects. Minimizing their reproductive loss. Migrating to destinations unknown. Silently declining at alarmingly sharp rates. Over its history, National Geographic has recorded and shared the marvels and mysteries of the animal kingdom, bringing the humorous, disgusting, tender, surprising, even shocking, careless, awe-inspiring aspects of animals to a global audience. We care about the secret lives of animals because we're scientifically curious, because discoveries lead to more questions, because animals are fascinating, we also care about the secret lives of animals because in investigating the ecological, social, reproductive, emotional lives of animals, we find out just how spectacular the planet is. And by investigating them, we reveal their conservation status. And by pulling out the stories, the details, the secrets of individual animals, their families, social groups, we have a powerful hook to pull in audiences and engage and activate them to care about the natural world. And you are gonna hear that now from our four panelists who are covering animals on land, air, and sea. Dr. Shane Garrow is assistant professor in the Marine Bioacoustics Lab at Aarhus University in Denmark and a National Geographic grantee. In 2005, Shane founded the Dominica Sperm Whale Project and has since spent thousands of hours in the company of sperm whales, families, which you're about to hear about. Shane's research is motivated by a desire to understand animal societies, how and why they form, and what happens when they fall apart. His work has been featured in the New York Times and on the BBC's Blue Planet 2. Shane. Thank you. <clears throat> Sperm whales have been sperm whales for longer than humans have walked upright. Their stories are older and deeper than our stories. And I'm gonna share one of those stories with you today. This is Digit. That's her mom, fingers looking down on her and her cousin Enigma rubbing from below. In these early grainy pictures taken a few days after her birth, she was already three meters long and over a metric ton. You know, about average for a newborn. <laughs> but her cousin, Enigma, when he reaches full size, in about 25 years' time, he'll be as long as two school buses and weigh as much as 10 of them. He will be Moby Dick. Now, I've known Digit's family since before she was born. In 2005, I founded the Dominica Sperm Whale Project. And through thousands of hours across the last 14 years, I've followed in their lives and the lives of about 25 other families. It's really been the first time that anyone has come to know these biblical leviathans as individuals with personalities, as brothers and sisters, as mothers and babysitters. When Digit's mom makes a deep dive for food, she can hold her breath for over an hour. She can dive three times deeper than a nuclear attack submarine. Her unique nose, which houses the most powerful natural sonar system, has allowed her to exploit the deepest parts of the oceans that we find difficult to even explore. It makes her a significant part of the oceanic ecosystem. Globally, we think sperm whales eat as much squid as all human fisheries combined. Sperm whale society is matrilineal. It's grandmothers, mothers, and daughters who live together for life, communally raising and defending their families. Family is critical to their survival. 
And this is Digit's family, a group of seven. They, rid, they live a rich and complex life in part of the world that we barely even see. And their families in the Caribbean are about seven animals, and each of them does things differently. They live as neighboring families in a community that's really a multicultural oceanic society. Because behavior is what you do, but culture is how you've learned to do it. They're all sperm whales, but they do things differently. Just as there's some humans who eat with forks and others that eat with chopsticks, sperm whales eat different things. They have different diving behavior, different social behavior, different habitat usage. And they mark themselves as distinct. Just as where I come from defines who I am, and who I am defines so much of what I do, these cultures are about their identity. And they appear to mark them with distinct dialects, distinct sets of codas. Families that use different dialects we call a clan. And the group of seven belongs to the Eastern Caribbean clan. They seem to use these codas to uh, broadcast their identity. One coda to represent the individuals, another set to define their families, and one unique one to mark their cultural clan. All of the animals in the Eastern Caribbean clan use the one plus one plus three. It's unique to them. We've only ever recorded it in the Caribbean. Calves take over two years to learn to make it right. They actually babble before getting it down accurately. <laughs> but they need to learn it accurately because they need to advertise their cultural group across huge geographic expanses that these animals use. When two sperm whale families meet at sea, they need to recognize one another. Because it turns out that families that share the same dialect, that belong to the same clan, will spend time together. And families that don't from different clans will not. And these cultures are not trivial. This isn't just animals learning from each other. It's part of the, their identity. They're broadcasting that they are different and where they belong. And with the help of National Geographic Society, I've been playing sounds back to these whales to gain a better understanding of how they recognize each other. And in a much larger project that I'm launching right now, we're starting to try to map the cultural boundaries of these clans on a global scale and to record their vocal cultures before they're lost. Because unfortunately, these animals are at risk. Digit was entangled in a plastic fishing line in 2015. She's the only female calf in her family. She's the future of her matriarchy. We've been killing whales for centuries, but we do so now out of ignorance rather than intent. And the worst thing we've ever done to sperm whales or any citizen of the ocean is to have ignored them. The group of seven is only three. Losing a large number of animals that I thought I would know for my entire life has been a personal tragedy, but it's forced me to ask an important question. Oh, <laughs> what happens if they're all gone? What happens when we lose a whale culture. Every culture, whale or otherwise, is a set of solutions about how to survive. If we lose that, we lose what it means to be a Caribbean sperm whale and generations of indigenous wisdom of how to survive there. That's why we can't define these populations simply by numbers. Our definition of biodiversity must include cultural diversity. These cultures are the reason that these families are surviving and we need to protect it. And I'm happy to say that Digit will survive. A few months ago, she was freed of her rope. She'll have a chance to pass on her cultural stories. Love your mom, learn from your grandmother, be a good neighbor, respect different solutions to everyday problems. If I've learned one thing from spending time in the culture of whales, it's the power of community. The story here is about building bigger definitions of us. They're different, but fundamentally the same. If I can talk about such similarities between their lives and our lives, between their values and our values, how different can we all be? 
In a time where we feel at our most divided, if we're gonna preserve life, ours and theirs, we need to coexist above the surface and below and value cultural diversity in our society and our ecosystem. Thank you. Dr. Jacinta Beener is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Psychology at the University of Michigan. She is co-director of the Simeon Mountains Gelada Research Project in Ethiopia, co-director of Capuchins at Toboga in Costa Rica, and director of the Core Assay Facility at Michigan. Jacinta is a National Geographic grantee and has twice been a Fulbright Scholar. Her research focuses on the sexual conflict between males and females with her main line of inquiry to determine why some animals are more successful at reproduction than others. Jacinta. Thank you. If I say the battle of the sexes, what image enters your mind? Maybe a tennis match, an IQ test, a driver's test, maybe an election. What if I told you that one of the most competitive battles of the sexes is an evolutionary arms race between males and females as they vie for control over their own reproduction? What do I mean by this? Well, every male may wish to mate with every female, but the reverse isn't always the case. So females have to decide which males to choose and which males to avoid. In another example, males may do the choosing for the females eliminating the competition so that females, maybe a little unhappy, have to sneak matings with their preferred males. These are just two examples where males and females come into what's known as sexual conflict over the who, what, when, where, and how of reproduction. And this sexual conflict can get aggressive. So males are sometimes twice the size of females and they can use this weight to sort of push themselves around and get what they want. They get the best food, they get the best sleeping sites, and in some cases, they get to mate with whomever, whomever they choose. But what if a female isn't ready to mate? Maybe she's still caring for a previous infant. This is when males unleash the ultimate weapon in the battle of the sexes, infanticide. Infanticide is when a male kills the offspring sired by a previous male. This accelerates the female's return to fertility, and so the male can then mate with the female sooner than otherwise. But this overt battle isn't the battle I want to talk about today. I'm going to describe a secret battle of the sexes. That, to the naked eye, goes almost unobserved. So for two decades, I've been studying wild primates in their natural habitats, and I've been able to get at some of their most intimate secrets using an unusual tool. I kind of like to think of myself as a fortune teller, reading a crystal ball, except the crystal ball that I read isn't made of crystal, sorry, the ball that I read isn't made of crystal, it's made of poo. And in some other talk, I can tell you about all the cool things I can learn from an animal's poo, but in this talk, I'm gonna tell you about an event that happened just a few hours before. And for this, I need to take you to the Simeon Mountains of Ethiopia. These mountains are home to geladas, a monkey I've been studying for 12 years. Geladas live in enormous herds, sometimes up to 1,200 individuals at a time. But there's structure to these herds. The herds are comprised of dozens of harems, each with their own dominant male, reproductive females, and their dependent offspring. And the dominant male does the majority of the mating in these, har in these harems. So, what happens when a challenger male arrives on the scene and sends the previous male packing? Gelata males are just as horrible as other males in this regard. They kill the infants, they mate with the females. Keep in mind, this is an enormous loss for the females. They've put a ton of time and energy into each infant. So, imagine you are a gelata female faced with the arrival of a new male. What do you do? I'd like to take you back to the first month I was ever watching geladas. I watched the first takeover of a harem. A young bachelor by the name of Fuji, pictured here on the left, challenged one of our leader males, Royal, pictured on the right. 
Within a few short hours, Fuji had killed Royal, he had control over the harem, and in the next few weeks, I would witness something so bizarre and so dramatic that happened to his females. But to understand this change, first, I need to describe the females before the takeover. Females were in every reproductive stage. There were fertile females, and we know they're fertile because they have these swollen beads surrounding a chest patch. There were lactating females, and there were pregnant females. Geladas give birth year round. So at any given time, most harems exhibit this exact same structure with only about 14% of the females fertile at any given time. Yet, in the, shortly after Fuji took over this group, all the females developed fertility. They all looked fertile. They showed these beads and they mated with Fuji. And I remember taking notes at the time. What a lucky male Fuji was. How did he know all of these females would suddenly be fertile? But in the decade that followed, I would learn Fuji wasn't lucky at all. This was a pattern I would see again and again and again. So what's going on with these females? Well, let's start with lactating females. Guess what? They're faking it. They're not fertile. This is fake news at its best. <laughs> totally. And the ploy works. Lactating females that develop these fertile, these uh, fake swellings are much, less, much more likely to avoid infanticide than those that don't. What's going on with pregnant females? Guess what? They're not faking it. They really are fertile. They ended their pregnancies the moment the male arrived. This is what's known as the Bruce effect. It was discovered in rodents in the 50s and 60s, laboratory rodents, but it had never been demonstrated in the wild until our study. And so, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, so how do we know that they're aborting? Well, this was where that tool that I told you about earlier comes in handy. We use their poo to measure their hormones. And these measurements tell us that the female is aborting the exact, same day the, the exact same day the male arrives. As in, he takes over the group in the morning, and by lunchtime, none of the females are pregnant anymore. So why does an otherwise healthy female terminate a pregnancy after invest, investing so much time and energy? Have you ever heard of the sunk cost fallacy? So this is the idea that humans continue to invest in a bad decision. Even though they know it's a bad decision, they keep investing in it because they've already invested in it. And the more they invest, the more they invest. We throw good money after bad. It's also called the Concord fallacy, named after a supersonic passenger jet that never delivered on all the billions and billions it took to develop. Back to my question, why do gelatas terminate a pregnancy? Well, it turns out reproductive biology understands sunk costs and knows when to abandon a pregnancy that's doomed. So this brings us to the first take home message of this talk, and that is this, reproductive suppression, so delaying or terminating a reproductive event can be adaptive. And it's especially adaptive if a female receives reliable cues that her infant won't survive, like an infanticidal male. The second take home message is this. Although infanticide appears to give males the win in the battle of the sexes, the full story is brilliantly more nuanced than this, with a lot of the answers being found in the physiological details. This isn't a simple story that's easily observed over a few short months. It requires long-term monitoring of both hormones and behavior from known individuals. It requires decades-long commitment to personnel and infrastructure, so we never miss a single exciting episode in our gelata ongoing soap opera. Thank you. So good. Dr. Mimi Kessler is director of the Eurasian Bustard Alliance, a group of researchers across northern Eurasia and the US who are working to advance scientific knowledge of this poorly understood group of birds. 
The group works on research that can inform conservation, bringing local people into the research process, promoting bustard awareness, and advancing conservation policy. Now, Mimi is a National Geographic grantee. She is the North Eurasian coordinator for the IUCN Bustard Specialist Group and has been called the Jane Goodall of Bustards. <laughs> Thank you, those are some big shoes to fill, but I'll do my best. I'm here to speak with you about the great buster today, and this is certainly an animal that deserves to have its story told. It is a bird of superlatives. The great buster is the heaviest animal capable of flight, with males weighing up to 40 pounds. So imagine a border collie flying over your head. This is also the bird that displays the largest difference in size between the sexes, with males in the back weighing up to three times more than the smaller females in the front. The reason for this tremendous difference in size is the breeding system of the birds. Each spring, male great bustards gather at traditional spots to perform one of the more elaborate breeding displays in the animal kingdom. They contort their bodies to transform from a predominantly brown bird into a bright white bustling ball of feathers. They inflate a blue air sac on their neck and they lift their beard and mustache feathers to flirtatiously frame their face for the females that are watching from the sidelines. So why haven't you heard of this exceptional bird? Well, first of all, they're incredibly rare. In Mongolia, where my long-term research is based, I work with the distinct eastern subspecies of great bustard. This is the bird about which Russian explorer Przewalski wrote, it is the steppe's constant companion and which Roy Chapman Andrews less poetically described as breeding in great numbers in 1932. Mm -hmm. Today we estimate that less than 2,000 individuals remain, making this bird more rare than snow leopards. The second reason is that this bird is incredibly wary. Typically these birds move away from humans before we can see them with the naked eye. So how do we go about finding the few remaining birds in the vast steppe landscape? And how do we study a bird when our very presence alters its behavior? Two technologies have allowed us to move through space and time with these birds to learn more about their lives. The first is satellite telemetry. Of course, capturing these birds is tough. I could give an entire presentation about how that goes down. But in brief, our team of five people works on average for an entire month just to capture a single bird. But this painstaking work has allowed us to unlock the secrets of great bustard life. We found that these birds undertake incredible journeys, on average flying 1,300 miles, 2,000 kilometers, from their breeding sites in northern Mongolia to overwinter in China. What's more, we've learned that they can make the journey in just one to eight days. Remember that this is the heaviest bird capable of flight, so moving all that mass, all that distance is an impressive feat. Most frequently, these birds take about two months on the journey, making multiple stopovers along the way to refuel. And we've learned that it's on these long journeys that the bustards are vulnerable. We've learned that they inhabit a dangerous world of power lines with which they collide, of poisons that they consume, and of poaching. This was a world that had been invisible to us as researchers working on the breeding grounds of the great bustard, and yet, Two-thirds of our tagged cohort of great bustards died due to these human causes. The transmitters also allow us to remotely monitor the reproductive success of great bustards. By determining how much a female moves each day, we can calculate whether that's compatible for, with her uh, incubating an egg, accompanying a small chick. And we found a remarkably low level of reproduction in the populations that we study, both through satellite telemetry and through our fall surveys of fledging chicks. We know that one of the major causes of low reproductive rates is that eggs and chicks are crushed by agricultural machinery. Others are depredated by foxes and crows. What satellite telemetry has revealed, a high rate of adult mortality combined with a low rate of reproduction, paints an alarming picture. These birds are at risk of disappearance from East Asian steppes. While satellite telemetry allows us to observe the movements of great bustards today, the second technology we use, genetic studies, allows us to look at the movements of ghost bustards. 
Let me explain. When we think about how likely these populations are to disappear, we wonder, are they likely to be recolonized? How similar are the two subspecies of gray bustard? Do they interbreed? To answer these questions, we traveled across Asia collecting dropped feathers from bustards, since it's easier for us to find a feather that the bird has left behind than to find and capture the bird itself. By analyzing genetic material from the feathers, specifically mitochondrial haplotypes, and examining the distribution of those haplotypes across Asia, we've determined that the two subspecies have been genetically isolated for 1.4 million years. For context, that's three times as long as the estimated time of divergence between polar bears and grizzly bears. These findings heighten urgency for conservation of the gray bustard. These birds are unique, and if they disappear, there's no coming back. Information we've gathered about the secret lives of gray bustards, where and why they die, whether their young survive, and about the movements of gray bustards over the past thousands of years are helping to inform us and develop, helping us to develop effective conservation programs from these birds, including outreach for rural school children. And since today the focus has been on women scientists, I'd like to share with you that over the course of our long-term research, over a dozen of the students that have participated in our programs have gone on to university degrees in biology. These are students from a very remote corner of Mongolia, and more than half of those have been women, young women. And our conservation programs also take us to the halls of international diplomacy. So we've partnered with the government of Mongolia to achieve an increase in the level of protection afforded to great bustards in Asia via the Convention on Migratory Species. This is an international agreement with 126 signatory countries and to develop an international intergovernmental framework for their conservation. Confronting the issues, the significant issues that are facing great bustards in Asia is going to require long-term commitment and funding from Asian governments and global conservation organizations. We need to decrease poaching, we need to mark power lines to reduce bird collisions, and we need to develop bustard-friendly, wildlife-friendly, community-friendly agricultural programs. If you have expertise in these areas or funding to support these programs, I welcome you to come talk with me so that we can work together, partner, to ensure that these birds Fantastic displays continue to grace the Asian steppes and their migrations to cross the continent. Thank you. Tom Peshak is a marine biologist turned conservation photographer for National Geographic, also a National Geographic grantee whose work focuses both on the beauty and fragility of the world's oceans, coasts, and islands. Tom is a founding and associate director of the Manta Trust, a senior fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers, and his work has won 10 Wildlife Photographer of the Year and six World Press Photo Awards. Tom's most recent project, supported by National Geographic, is called Seabird Crisis and appears in the July issue of the magazine. Tom. Seabirds are very boring. The only thing that rhymes with dull is gull. <laughs> no seabird has ever done anything interesting. All they do is steal your french fries at the beach, <laughs> and then they poo all over you. <laughs> this is what I used to believe because I was a single-minded and perhaps simple-minded underwater photographer who crisscrossed the oceans photographing mainly sharks. Sharks were my everything. <laughs> Seabirds? Eh, not so much. Until I learned that in the last 60 years, 230 million seabirds have vanished off the face of the Earth. And today, they are the most endangered large group of birds in the world. As a photographer and storyteller, I, I asked myself immediately, how can I visualize these huge declines? And I searched archives for 
historical images taken before the declines began. In, in southern Africa, I came across this image from the late 1890s showing a vast African penguin colony, almost 100,000 strong. Now, less than 2,000 penguins nest on Halifax Island. I also projected you know, these you know, historical images into the modern day landscape, often bereft of seabirds. And I often felt I was actually resurrecting the ghosts of seabird past with images like this. Now, most seabirds live on remote islands or they feed far out at sea. So I knew that in order to get people to care, I really had to you know, live amongst these birds for long periods of time to be able to you know, reveal their secretive but oh so fascinating lives. Now, most seabird still thrives on remote islands, and Marion is no exception, you know, situated halfway between Africa and Antarctica. And this is a wild, wild place. And right off the bat, I am greeted by the mother of all storms. I hiked for three weeks with a 100-pound pack in such conditions to reach the dancing grounds of the world's largest flying bird, the wandering albatross. And they gather on the coastal plain with this repertoire of bowing and sky pointing. And they look, oh, so elegant, but they sound like donkeys. I love these guys. Albatrosses are tough. However, even they are sometimes defenseless against certain threats. High on an inaccessible cliff, I found this scalped and bleeding albatross. And to you know, see the culprit in the act, we have to wait until nightfall. And this next video was shot by a young seabird biologist, Stefan Scumbi, who was with us on this expedition. Now, mice were introduced to Marion by the sealers in the late 1800s. However, only recently have they begun to eat baby albatrosses alive. And this behavior appears to be on the increase, so you know, they might degrade one of the last Southern Ocean seabird sanctuaries in only a decade or so. I cannot in good conscience leave you with this horror show, especially right before lunch. So here we have Tetara Koya Koya, or the pyramid the only known nesting ground of the endangered Chatham albatross. And you know, recently it was deemed that the all eggs on one sort of rock scenario was deemed too risky. And the Chatham Island Tiger Trust is gonna create a second backup colony. And that was my job. I traveled there to document this conservation project. However, the pyramid is almost perfectly round and exposed to Southern Ocean swell. So you can only land there on a handful of days of years. So the waiting began in my small farm cottage and there's no cell phone reception on the chat. And so every evening I waited at the radio and I heard the crackling. No, the waves are still too big, or no, it's still too windy, or no, for a whole bunch of other reasons. The first sort of eight, nine days of waiting were okay. However, on day 12, I sort of started to become cabin fever. And I turned to photographing the only thing in my vicinity, which was sheep. I began with your standard group portrait, Day 14, I became visually slightly more adventurous. I call this one sheep walking. <laughs> Day 17 it was the beginning of my artistic phase. <laughs> day 19, I coined the phrase, a sheep a day will keep your psychiatrist at bay. <laughs> day 22, uh, you know, sheep, <laughs> backlit sheep. Day 27, sheep at sunset. And you know, day 27, I was as freaked out as these sheep stuck between a fence and this bush because day 28 was the last day of my expedition and my last opportunity to reach the pyramid. That evening, miraculously, the radio crackled, yes. And after 27 days of sheep, I finally got my first glimpse of the pyramid. This was an awe-inspiring place. And how do you get on it? Well, you pretty much ram your zodiac at high speed into a kelp-covered gully, and you leap for your life. Now, catching 60 young albatross sticks, that should be relatively easy. However, these guys have a rather interesting defensive strategy. They projectile hurl 
you know, oil, exorcist style, at the researchers. And after a rather messy three to four hours, you know, all the birds are safely in their boxes on the boat, and they're heading to their new home, where instead of being fed by their parents, they'll be fed by the researchers. And in middle of March this year, they began to exercise their wings for the first time, you know, learning how to fly. And by April 15th, the last of these guys actually took to the sky and they headed out into the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. And here they will feed for the next three to five years and then they will hopefully come back to this new colony and to nest there for the first time themselves. So with this story, I wanted to show that seabirds are every bit as fascinating as sharks. They are as iconic as panda bears and as adorable as lion cubs. They are caring parents and you know, incredible deep sea divers. And they can be as fierce as they are ecologically critical. Now, the, the article is out in the July issue of National Geographic magazine, so please check it out. And the other, I want to acknowledge my incredible you know, helper, Otto Whitehead, who shot all of the video that you experienced here today. I thank you all very much, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate it. the rich, complex lives of animals. Um, thank you for revealing these, and we have so little time. So I'm gonna ask one question um, to the panel and then kick it out to the crowd, so be thinking about what you want to ask our, our panelists. To me, the through line here is um, the importance of a couple of resources, or needed tools, time and technology. Um, technology is pretty obvious, the advances in hormones and genetics and tracking technology, um, photography, but what about time? Especially, you know, you guys are working with long-lived, social, intelligent creatures. You don't just show up on a, a summer field course and, and reveal, unravel these secrets. So, Shane, I'll start with you, um, because you are working on such a large social animal. Can you talk about the importance of time in your work to pull out these secrets of individuals and families over generations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'd say life is like the longest form of storytelling that there is. And um, if we're gonna understand that, we need to invest a lot of time in that. We need to invest a lot of time at sea or in the mountains or behind a camera, but we also need to invest time in government offices and boardrooms to sort of make the case for nature because we're losing time with these animals very quickly. And it's getting harder to find the sort of long-term support that these kinds of projects that are answering long-term questions need uh, when we're not addressing sort of 12-month deliverable-based yeah. um, kind of things. So, you know, we were, we've been working with Brian Scarry for the last couple of years, and he's gonna be coming back next year. So he's shooting for three different years um, in order to sort of document these stories because you need to be there or you'll miss part of the story. Mm. Um, so time is the most important thing that we can invest with, with wildlife, in my opinion. Thanks. Jacinta? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it. These are long-lived, a lot of us studied long-lived animals, and really, you don't reap the benefits of, of studying a long-lived animal till they get to a, a later time in their life. So, for example, we're just now seeing the adults that were born in 2006 when we first started watching them. We're watching them have kids, and now we know what they're like as parents and as grandparents. Mm -hmm. So we need this full story. So for example, like I could take you out to the geladas, and within an hour, please. Yeah, <laughs> within an hour you would know, oh, yeah, female A is definitely, definitely dominant to female B. But what you wouldn't know, having, you know, without this long demography on these animals, is that female B is female A's daughter. And she's not just her daughter, she's her youngest daughter. And so, you know, this time element really captures not only that, which I guess technology can also get at, but with DNA, but even the DNA can't get at, when did this female become dominant? Why did the mom allow her to be dominant? Mm. And what is the reproductive success of that? Mm. So just having that long component of time, following individuals through time, and just funding these long-term research projects from their inception, and the longer they've been out there, the more they really should be funded to keep it going. Great answers, both of you. Mimi, do you wanna add well, to anything to that? 
Yeah, I'd like to echo what both Shane and Jacinta said and add that when you're working with endangered populations, simply finding the birds can be quite time consuming. So I did have one entire field season where I didn't find a single gray bustard, but I did find a snow leopard. So oh, that was right. <laughs> That's a good trade-off. <laughs> it's a trade-off. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> But additionally, some of the most interesting observations we've made have come from multi-year observations of single tagged individuals. Um, it's interesting to note when an animal changes its behavior over time, whether that's due to learning or due to environmental change, both are interesting observations. And also in the case of a long-lived animal, a longer time period of study allows you a greater chance of observing a one-off but important event such as uh, the time of mortality, the time of death of the bird, which has provided so much insight for us about what we need to do to conserve them, or a case of successful reproduction, which we think is more common as the birds age. Okay, thank you. And Tom. Time is my everything, you know, my, the most precious resource I have. Let's take the Marion Horror Mouse Expedition situation. I was, that was a 38-day expedition. I was on the icebreaker for 12 days back and forth. Uh, I think we hiked for a grand total of 10 full days, 10 to 12 hours each day. I think we were stuck by storms for eight and nine days, which left me probably with eight days of photography, which is about 25%. Now, however, out of those eight days, I probably had 25 hours of good light in 38 days. That's like 2.8%. Like and National Geographic Magazine is the last sort of publication in the world that actually puts us out there for these periods of time, because otherwise, we could never actually dig that deep. Mm. So time is my most precious commodity, full stop. Hands down over technology, so. Uh... Thanks, you guys, are, you guys are so good. I'm gonna open it up to the audience now and look for hands, and one just shot up uh, right in front here. The mouse. <laughs> no, Tom, you know, you're one of my favorite photographers and your work is stunning and this Why did I know about the mouse would come? This particular, I, I, this particular series is just out of the park and, and thanks for migrating past the shark and, and focusing on the seabird, that's amazing. <laughs> but I mean, come on, the mouse. I think for me, I just have the burning question right now is why wasn't the bird moving? The mice were only introduced about a few hundred years ago and they just didn't evolve with them. They have n nothing internally programmed they kind of do something against it. There's just no, there's no recognition. They literally, I spent weeks up there looking at this thinking, come on, it's sitting on your head. Please, <laughs> there's just no nothing. Um, that is one of the big mysteries, and that's one of the huge threats. Um, no, they're probably in pain, but there's just no, they're not programmed. To, that behavior doesn't seem to exist within them for whatever reason, and um, that's why we have to get rid of these mouse ASAP, and hopefully eradication will happen in 2020, but uh, we need, a lot of money to do that. So anybody who wants to help out kill some mice on Marion Island to save albatrosses, <laughs> catch me after this panel, please. Overlap. Otherwise, more videos for the next hour on a loop again <laughs> and again and again and again and again. I will do it, I promise. <laughs> um, honestly, those were mind-blowing presentations, yeah. really. Thank you so much. So you're really having to protect the ecosystems to protect the species that you're all working in. And you've come up with obviously ideas on how to do that. Have you compiled or aggregated those actions that we can get behind to protect the ecosystems within which the species that you're studying exist? Did you have someone in particular you wanted to direct that to or is that across the panel? No, because I think it's common to all of the species, Great. whether it's marine or terrestrial. Does anyone want to start with that? We just do one question each or whatever. I mean. Yeah, I think you're right that a lot of these feel global ecosystem scale issues. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways and in a lot of environments, we're only starting to look at those now. I think each of us probably have individual initiatives you could probably uh, learn more about and support. Um, but I think National Geographic is also a leader at bringing these big scales uh, to the forefront. Uh, so I think that would probably be a good place to start um, following up with each of us and, and and furthering your connections with National Geographic. I don't have anything to add. That was that was good. We each, I think, we've talked to each of you. We all have our own nonprofits that kind of are meant to preserve the habitat that we're working within. But National Geographic has supported all of our research throughout, and that's also, you know, they do this best. So, 
Well, one of the frameworks I described that we've been working through is the Convention on Migratory Species. And recently, we held a conference bringing together experts on the gray bustard from across its Asian range. And together, we're putting together an action plan with targeted activities for each country to undertake um, and presenting those activities prioritized is one of the next steps in our plan to the countries. Uh, the mice aren't only t targeting albatross, they also feed on petrels and other seabirds. So by removing the mice from here, and you're also protecting the whole ecosystem as a whole in terms of functioning. So again, you know, removal of one invasive actually, you know, goes beyond a single species recovery. But other than that, I mean, you've you know, answered that wonderfully. So. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with the Convention of Migratory Species. That was actually the first international venue where they recognized cetacean culture as an important part of managing them um, and recognizing that we need to move beyond genetic stocks um, and uh, conserve you know, beyond genetics and, and monitor these, these cultural communities. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one last quick one. Yep, I see. Oh, oh. oh it was already over here. Sorry, this is Sylvia. We have time for two questions more. Yep. <laughs> Mike and fast. So this whole gathering of explorers is about connections. And what this panel has kind of brought together is a rationale for why it isn't good enough just to protect individual species or habitats. You've got to look at the larger systems, which means larger areas where we respect nature, whether they're parks, uh, monuments, you name whatever you, you want to call them, marine protected areas or national parks. We have been trivializing, in a sense, the importance of the cultural side of the rest of life on Earth. And as concerning connections, you know, the last panel talked about the real cost of what you consume when you take a fish, think about the turtles, but you also should think about the albatrosses, about the whales, about the other creatures that are entangled by the massive amount of fishing gear that is deployed both legally and illegally into the sea. And so maybe Shane and Tom particularly, you might comment on the impact that we are having because of our appetite for ocean wildlife, we call it fish and shrimp and <laughs> lobsters and things, but it takes down much of the rest of what's out there. And the importance of having much larger areas in the sea where we respect not just the individual species, but the many variations on the theme of cultures uh, and we call it what you will, societies. Tom or Shane? Um, at start? their peak, I think industrial longland fisheries killed probably 50,000 albatrosses every single year, and that was probably in the mid-90s. You know, now that has been hugely reduced, so that's a major, major step. You know, I, we've eradicated many, many islands of rats and mice over the last so 15 years, so you know, with seabirds, we are moving in the right direction. Things are better today than they've ever been. So, you know, I mean, we have turned, at least with that sort of group of animals, we have been able to turn things around. Mm -hmm. You know, seabirds are weird because they live both on land and in the sea. You kind of have to have a two-pronged conservation, you know, um, methodology for them, which makes them especially tricky. And if we can, you know, handle seabirds and we can have major impacts there, hopefully that will also, you know, trickle down to other species on the food chain, forage fish and things like that. So um, that is the hope anyway in that regard. Um, and from a cultural perspective, I think these animals are literally broadcasting the management units that we should be using. Uh, and they're far wider than our national boundaries, which they have very little respect for. Uh, and so, um, you know, our initiative where we're starting to map those now will be really important to take those through CMS and the IUCN to redefine how we protect them based on their own identity. Um, you know, our presence in the ocean is very real. You know, one in three calves born in Dominica won't make it till its first birthday. Um, and I think entanglement is a, a big issue. We need to work together both with, you know, stakeholders who are out there in the water uh, and on top of the water um, and find win-win scenarios where boat traffic isn't ripping up fishing gear, which isn't entangling whales. 
Um, and we're working on that right now in a framework in the Caribbean to try and minimize ship disturbance of fishing gear, uh, which leads to these entanglements. Yeah. Great answers. I didn't know if we had time for the last question or were cut. No time. Okay. <laughs> so, come and um, find us afterwards. Yeah, please come and find them afterwards. And I will say we have a panel later today on making the case for nature, which I think you'll agree this panel helped us start. So um, thank you very much, and please thank them. Thank you.